Africans have lost faith in themselves. They cannot trust themselves. They will never print ballots in Ghana because we, for some reason, believe that we are thieves and that if we print them, we'll steal them. In Zambia recently, they printed their ballots. In Dubai, in Kenya, we printed our ballots. In the United Kingdom, all the former French colonies will have them printed in Paris. Then you wonder why our politics is controlled by external factors. When African politicians have been engaged in an election, the very first congratulatory word that they expect, if they were colonized by the British, they are waiting very eagerly whether the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom will ring them. And once they receive that call, then they will know that we have been approved and we are now good to go. There is need for reawakening in the manner in which we do things. In fact, there is a sense in which if we do not go back to what Kwame said in 1963, the, the tragedy is that Kwame Nkrumah could see this in 1963. He could see it. And that is, that is why he was saying, let us unite now. Because it is only in unity. I remember in 1963 when he's talking about political unity, he's saying, I am urging all of those, all of you who are present here today, let us come out of this hall with a united Africa, with one army, with a one command unit, with one common currency, because it is only then that we are going to immunize ourselves from the shenanigans of our colonizers. Of course, you ended up with your little sovereignties, and today your politics are the subject of manipulation by European powers. If you had accepted Kwame Nkrumah's view, he was clear at that time that you would have one passport. Today, I moved three hours to Togo. I have a Togolese passport printed in France, <laughs> written in French, asking you about immigration and yellow fever certificate, <laughs> and asking you to look at a gadget in your eyes whether you have a, a Ebola. And yet the pastoralists across the border never looked at those things and never required any passport. Nkrumah could see this, and all this is courtesy of bad politics. You go between Senegal and Gambia, they are quarreling about the border and, and the boundaries. And if you, when you cross the lead, the, the, the nation, there are different ethnic, the same ethnic groups across the border. Africa must, in the nature of things, ask herself, what must we do with our politics? This is the mother question. And why is this question important? It is important because I can tell you without being a Jewish prophet nor being related to one, that if we do not do anything about our politics, Africa will go nowhere. Today, there are two types of people who look at Africa. They are the Afro-pessimists and Afro-optimists. The Afro-pessimists take the view that Africa is God-forsaken, that Africa will go nowhere, that Africans will perpetually be hewers of wood and drawers of water for other civilizations, that Africa will only be humored by other civilizations. Those are the Afro-pessimists. Then there are those who take the view that Africa is now on the rise, that Africa can realize our potential, 
that Africa with our 1.1 billion people is capable in the next 50 years of competing with other civilizations. I am myself an Afro-optimist of the guarded kind. I believe that this continent has the capacity to shock the world. I have the conviction that this continent has the capacity to change Africa and to change the world. Has it ever been lost on you that Africa has always been on the rise? Through different historical epochs, Africa has always been on the rise. In the 15th century, when the Portuguese were building the Elmina Castle, Africa was on the rise. But it was on the rise for the Portuguese. Then it rose for the Dutch at the same castle. Then it rose for the English. Then it appeared to rise for the Ghanaians in 1957. It appeared to rise. Then something held her down and Ghana could never quite soar. And there was an apparent darkness at noon, but I now know it was never a sunset. I knew it was an eclipse. <laughs> and because it is an, ex an eclipse and there's only the clouds that have kind of shielded it, I know the African sun will rise in her splendor. But it will only rise if we begin to do things differently. Today, there are few African countries that give me confidence that if we identify the right things, Africa can rise. And these things are happening in the political arena. When I look at Botswana, that little country which in 1966 was called Bechuanaland, which was given to Cesare Sekama as if it was nothing. The only thing that they were famous for was cattle rearing. They did not think much of Botswana. Then one year later, Botswana discovered diamond. And the rest is history. They have demonstrated to the world that with your little resources, you can manage those resources effectively. They have demonstrated that you can have a democracy which is a democracy in name. They have had a culture which recognizes that leadership is not a wrestling match. Leadership is an opportunity to serve, and elections are an opportunity in the democratic marketplace where the people give an opportunity to men and women to govern for a period. So between 1966, without the intervention of a coup d'etat, they have had Sassere Sekama govern them, they have had Ketumile Masire govern them, they have had Festus Mohai govern them. They have had Ian Kama govern them. And is the only country on the continent of Africa ever to have had a budget surplus. It can be done. When I see Botswana, I know that it can be done. But it, it demonstrates that when you have the right politics and create the right environment, then you can see. And if you visit Botswana today, you are able to see. You don't need any explanation. You know, I've always said when somebody says that they have done something and they have to spend one hour explaining what they have done, then they have done nothing. <laughs> When you have done something, you shut up. The things that you have done speak for themselves. And that is not the only country. The other country is Rwanda. In 1994, never 
in the history of the world post 1945 did the world witness 100 and 100 days of a pogrom where people rose against one another killing each other one million Rwandese of the Tutti extraction killed even in churches then the leadership of Paul Kagame came a little country tucked inside the heart of Africa with no ocean to boast of, to export our goods, a landlocked country, with no natural resources, no tourist ex attraction except a few gorillas. <laughs> what they have demonstrated by dint of proper and organized leadership is that when you introduce an environment, there is no shortage of detractors of Paul Kagame and some of the things that he does. But when you look at the history of Rwanda, perhaps there is justification for what he's doing for the moment. That country, you go to Kigali, perhaps the cleanest city in Africa, and you see that when you have men and women who love their country and are clear about where they want to go, then countries can realize their potential. When I see Rwanda, I know that Africa can rise. It is not my design to constipate you with information, but allow me to go to Mauritius. <laughs> Mauritius is a little island, only famous for sugarcane and tourism. A young country, a leader with a clear vision, some of you will remember him. He looked at the country, recognized that we had no resource, and he said, my only resource is human resource. My only resource is sugar cane. So what do I do? do? I add value to my sugar cane, make my human resource good resource, and lo and behold, the second country in Africa ever to have had a budget surplus. It can be done. In other words, Africa has demonstrated that as long as you have hygiene in your politics, as long as your political radar points in the right direction, then you can achieve. 